we record. Okay, so in uh, 2020 and in 2021, UMAC is commemorating its 20th anniversary. And to mark this special occasion, we are organizing among other initiatives, a series of conversations with personalities, mostly museum professionals, but not only, who have been involved in the creation and development of UMAC. If you do not know what UMAC is, it is the Committee of the International Council of Museums, ICOM, for University Museums and Collections. So UMAC is a global forum for all those working in or associated with academic museums, galleries, and collections. And our interest and mission is to promote university museums and collections as essential resources devoted to research, education, and the preservation of cultural, historical, natural, and scientific heritage of higher education. We will provide links to ICOM and UMAC uh, in the um, video description below. So UMAC was imagined in the late 1990s by an international group of museum professionals who realized that university museums face specific issues because they are part of a higher education institution. This group agreed to propose to ICOM that a new committee be formed for university museums and collections. The new committee, we speak, uh, became known as UMAC, was officially created in June 2000 by the ICOM Executive Board. And it had its first meeting in July the 2nd, 2001, during the 19th General Conference of ICOM in Barcelona. Our guest today has not only been part of that initial international group of people who imagined UMAC, but she has also been UMAC's longest serving board member. So let me introduce you to Dr. Lyndall King, a dear friend and colleague who until very recently, mere weeks ago, was the director, <laughs> was the director of one of the most spectacular university museums uh, in the world. And I have it here for you. Oh, fabulous. Mark. I know, the Wiseman Art Museum at the University of Minnesota in uh, Minneapolis. Lindo, thank you so much for agreeing to open this series of conversations about the origins of UMAC. And uh, before we dig in into university museums proper, let me mm -hmm. just ask you, how and when in your life did you become interested in museums? Why did you become a museum professional? Well, you know, I grew up in a very small community in Kansas, which is smack dab in the middle of the United States. And it, I never went to an art museum until I was in college, until I went to the State University of Kansas, which although in the same state was 400 miles from where um, I grew up, from my town. My town had a population of about 2,000 people. And my father was not a farmer, but he was in the grain business. He ran uh, the local grain elevator, the grain mill. So um, I grew up in a very rural environment. I never went to an art museum, um, but until I went to college at the University of Kansas, where I majored in microbiology and virology. And when I left the university, I worked as a chemist uh, for a while. And then I worked uh, in a virology research lab for a while. Wow. I didn't and, know that. That's you amazing. Didn't know that? No. Yeah. Wow. Yes, I, I did tissue culture. I did all of that sort of stuff. Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> several years and um, I know this may be more than you want to know but when That's I was a, <laughs> when I was a sophomore in college I went to Germany on a language program and I realized at that point that there was a whole lot of world that I didn't know anything about because sure. in, in the middle of the US you're very far from anything and most of the people in my town 
didn't travel very far away. So, and we were far distant from any urban areas. So I realized from that ex experience as an undergraduate that there was a lot of the world that I didn't know about. I went, I, I went to my first opera. I, I went to my, I did a lot of things in, in Germany that uh, I, I made me realize how much there was that I didn't know. So after um, I left, uh, after we, my, I, I got married, my husband and I both worked at, went back to the University of Kansas where we worked for, I worked in the virology lab and he taught journalism and we saved all of our money and we went on a uh, trip to Europe for six months. We had just saved all of our money and said, we'll come home when we run out of money. And we had a, a tent that we bought in Paris and sleeping bags that we bought in Paris and so we spent the next six months traveling all the way east to Istanbul. Fantastic. And all the way north to Norway. We, we went home when it got really, really cold. Our last stop was England and it was really cold and wet in November. So, um, and we'd run out of money. So we went home and we came to um, the University of Minnesota. Um, and I had realized by this point that if I wanted to do anything really interesting with my life, I had to have an advanced degree. And of course, with my background being in science, uh, I had been pushed toward doing something in the sciences. Sure. But I, I had a love for art, art history from having taken some classes in, in my undergraduate years and from, ha from having been in Europe yeah. and having seen all of the incredible monuments in Europe all over. Uh, so I decided I would get a master's degree in art history just until I made up my mind whether I wanted to go to medical school or what I wanted to do. But then I never looked back and I ended up getting a PhD in art history. And it so happens that when I was ready to look for a job. I love the higher education, the U.S. <laughs> higher education system where you can get a degree in microbiology and a PhD in art history. I love it. It's yeah, it was, I was very, very lucky, Marta. It's not unusual. It's not an usual thing, you know. It's not a usual. I know. Path. It's not unusual in the U.S. to make those kinds of changes. Wow. wow. But wow. Uh, when I when I ended up with my degree in art history, there weren't any, uh, any jobs for academics for teaching. So um, I, by accident, I went into a museum job. And I realized much later that I was very lucky again because the museum was exactly the right place for me. I wanted to uh, bring a love to art to students primarily because it had changed my life as an undergraduate, uh, having a university museum and being able to go to a university museum as a place of refuge and as a place to learn, to learn from. This is an art museum I'm talking about. Uh, so um, I, I really have a firm belief in the value of university museums yeah, as yeah. a way to change people's lives yeah, because, yeah, it, yeah. because I experienced it firsthand. You experienced it yourself. That, that's yes. right. That's right. And we're okay. Let's get let's start in yeah, dissecting. No, because then you okay, you became involved and you never looked back. You never I went never back to back. back. You no, never looked never back, looked you know, back. it changed your life really. Yeah. But there's some point in the late 1990s where you become involved in this movement. At that time, people didn't even know it was a movement. But now when we look back, we know, we realize that there was a movement to organize university museums, uh, both at national level and also international level. So you became part of this group uh, mm -hmm. that met in Paris in, in the prehistory yeah. of your Mac. So tell us a little bit about that story, how you became involved, uh, how you went up and gave the, this beautiful keynote speech uh, in, uh, in Paris that Paris, kicked, yeah. off, kicked off the UMAC, actually. It, okay, it did, tell, us, actually. tell us about it. And again, that was a lot of serendipity. Um, I was interested in, from my, from my undergraduate time and, in, and from our, our trip to Europe when I, uh, after, before I went to graduate school, I knew there was a lot out there that most American museum colleagues at universities didn't know about. Yeah. And so I was interested in uh, what we could learn internationally, particularly in the US, because I felt that our museums, particularly on university campuses, were uh, too insular. And we, we saw each other, we talked to each other, but we didn't have the opportunity for international, um, 
international collaboration the way a lot of our academic colleagues did, because you know there have been international yeah. disciplinary exchanges yeah. and seminars. But there for was, a long sorry time. to interrupt, but there was already mm -hmm. the American Association. Well, now it's called the Academic um, the Association. Yeah, but there was already a national network of university, university. museums. Yes, wasn't and it? I was. I helped found that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. Um, it was, it used to be the association of uh, ACUMG. The ACUMG, exactly, exactly. Association of College and University Museums and Galleries. And I was one of the founders of that organization as well, because I do believe so much in how much we can learn from each other. Each other. Yeah. And also that we need support. Yes. Because we're in an environment which can be hostile Yes. Uh, which cannot appreciate, which does not always appreciate what we have to offer. And we have an incredible amount to offer to the teaching of uh, universities, to the academic enterprise, and to the lives of students. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, I knew but that. But you we can feel support. isolated sometimes. You can it feel can. isolated, alone, and so on. Yeah, yeah, because there's no one else really quite like you on the campus. I mean, the faculty yeah. are different. Yeah. And uh, some of our colleagues are also members of the faculty, but um, but working in a museum, you don't really have a lot of close colleagues in a university environment who understand your issues That's right. uh, oftentimes. And so you need to seek out uh, support groups and networks outside. So I was a firm believer in that. And I actually got involved with the European group when I, I was invited by the American Swedish Institute here in Minneapolis to be a delegate to our sister city of Uppsala. Uppsala, which has uh -huh. fabulous <laughs> museums and collections. They have does, a very old, does. very old university in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Oops, yeah, they have an operating theater, which they had recently restored. And um, Ingmarie Montel was, I think, fairly new as the director uh, yes. of the museum there at Uppsala. And I met yes. her during that trip. And I also had an interview with the president of the university. Oh, that's interesting. And, I, and it's interesting. Um, and, and he said to me, well, you know, there's going to be a meeting of university museum directors in Europe in Paris in the fall, and I will make sure you get invited to pr present a proposal. Which date was this exactly? So that our, 1999, right? It must right? have been 1999. It must have been 1999. Yeah, I can find that date for sure, but it was 98 or 99, and I think it was 99. Yes. And so um, I thought that was fabulous, and I would like to do it, and I waited, and I didn't hear anything for a long time, and then surprisingly, here came an invitation to uh, submit a proposal. So <laughs> this is the really funny part of the story, Marta. I submitted a proposal and I waited and I waited and I waited and I got zero response. And I thought, well, okay, they decided they didn't want me after all. Yeah. About three weeks before the conference, no. maybe two weeks before the conference, I got a call from somebody who said, well, we were supposed to have a keynote address from someone from UNESCO, but he's backed out. So would you like, would you be willing to give the keynote address? You see? And I thought, well, wait a minute. I said, well, I submitted a proposal to give a paper and I never heard anything. He said, oh, you didn't? Oh, well, we accepted it. <laughs> but I didn't know Fantastic. that. Fantastic. So then I had to make the decision, would I be able to pull together something in two weeks, basically, yeah. Yeah. to yeah. present uh, in Paris? And I decided, why not? Let's yeah, do course. it. So I did it. And so I arrived in Paris. And that's how I got there. Would you authorize me to make it available? The, of course, you can, you know, um, change any, you know. Sure, to, I will. There, put your date. Some, yeah, make it available for UMAC members because it's not anywhere because it's be before UMAC, before we had yeah. our journal, before. So it's kind of outside the radar. And perhaps yeah, sure. it would be nice to make it available in our website uh, if people are interested. I, uh, I can do that. I'd like, I will, you know, there's some notes in the text because it was made to be spoken and not yeah, sure. uh, written. No, but, uh, and, and it's fine. I'll you, take those out. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you can do it as it is, whatever, however you want, Marta. But uh, however you, know, you want. Oh. <laughs> I looked at it the other day, and I could see a lot of things have changed. So you yes. do need to remember that this was 20 years ago. That's why we're going to put the date and so on, and the co yeah. and the context, so that people know that this was 20 years ago. You know, more than yeah. 20 years ago. So more, more than 20. And years so, ago. and who was organizing actually? Because I heard it was Finland, not Sweden. 
who Finland was involved uh, I, in some way, wasn't it? Well, it was at the Finnish uh, Arts and Culture Center. I think it was. Oh, yeah. I think it was organized by uh, UNESCO. Okay. Uh, or uh, bec and I heard at the time, and I don't know if this is true, that it was held at the um, Finnish uh, Cultural Center rather than at the um, ICOM headquarters in Paris uh, for bureaucratic reasons because okay. it was just easier to work. That okay. the Finnish government okay. really wasn't involved in organizing it. That it was ICOM that was involved in organizing it. Was it was easier to deal for for um, reasons of having to do with translation and of course, and, of course, and of all course. that sort of thing. If it weren't at ICOM headquarters in Paris, so that's why it was at the Finnish Cultural Center. Yes, but yeah. um, I met uh, wonderful people there who were all involved. And, uh, the group, the group that later created UMAC was already there. So yeah, you they would were, have Ingmarie, Ingmarie Munktel. Let's look at the picture. Let's look at the picture because maybe you don't remember. You are on it, okay? You are on Am the I? picture. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's li let's look at the group, the oh first ever group picture of my UMAC. Goodness. This is two thousand and one. Wow. And look, there you are. This is you, darling. That, that's true. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is you. It's amazing. Oh my and goodness. It's here amazing. behind is Penny, Penny from Greece, yeah. you know, Teologi Guti. And this is Sally McDonald. Remember yeah. Sally McDonald from I do, UCL? I do. Yeah. Okay, this is me, very young PhD student. Oh, look, I look, remember look. you very well, Marta. It's amazing. Oh yeah. my God. And, and this is Fausto, yeah. Fausto Pugnaloni, remember, from Italy? Yeah. Okay. This is, I forgot her name, Marie, from the University of Amsterdam, from I the special remember. collections of the University of Amsterdam. And here is um, uh, Rafaela, Rafaela Simili, from okay. Bologna, from okay. Bologna. And here is from Finland, what's her name? She was in the first board. Uh, it will uh, come to me. And uh, Ingmarie Munktel, here she is. Ingmarie yeah, Munktel. Ingmarie, um, 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 let's see, was on the first word. Kati, Kati. And there's Kati, Ingmarie. Kati, Kati enemies, exactly. Yeah. And this is our first vice chair, Stephen de Klerk, here behind. Right. You see him? Yeah. Yeah, I see. I remember Stephen very well. Stephen de Klerk. And Cornelia. Cornelia like. Weber here, yeah. who then became chair of UMAC in 2007, I think, 2007, maybe, maybe earlier. And Aldona uh, Donaitis was there from... Um, Aldona, yeah, but she's not, she was her. there, but I don't see her. No. I don't see her in the picture, but I remember she was there. I see Françoise Le Guetuli from Nice. She was working at the Observatoire of Nice in France. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there are uh, Peter Tyrell. Look, Peter yeah, Tyrell Peter here. Tyrell. Yeah, Peter Tyrell. Yeah, there yeah. he is, American too. So there were Americans, there were people from Israel, there were people from Australia. Although our chair, first chair, Peter Stembury, I don't see him here. Maybe he was taking the photo. Maybe, Maybe he, was he was taking, was taking the, photo. the photo because yeah. he was certainly, definitely here. Italy, Sweden, the US, Greece, Portugal, the Netherlands, France. Nice bunch, you know. Nice yeah, it bunch. was a good bunch, and it was it was really, really um, a quite compatible bunch of people, all of whom were devoted to university museums yeah, yeah. and to international collaboration and learning from each other. And I think that's what's made yeah. uh, UMAC so successful. So so, so special, yeah. Do yeah. you think when you you were there in the middle eh, at the beginning, yeah. do you think it was difficult for UMAC to be created? in ICOM, in the International Council of Museums, which is such a, a big, you know, to date has 50,000 members, museum right. professionals and museums. At the time, certainly didn't have that many, but still, it must have been difficult to create a committee for university museums. Uh, it, was, it was important or it was probably needed to defend the spe specific specificity of university museums, right? What memories do you have of that process? My memories of that process are that, you know, first we all had to get our own act together and we had to um, write and be able to articulate well the need for such a committee in a convincing way. 
uh, because there was opposition from other international committees because of course you know that um, ICOM stipends are based on the number of members and the university uh, members from university museums in ICOM were already members of other committees and there was a fear on the part of other committees that they would lose members to, um, to the, this new committee that was specific to university museums and that therefore they would lose some funding. So there was some internal opposition uh, to this new committee. Why was it needed? Weren't the needs already being taken care of by Yeah, because if you were an archaeology university museum, there was already a committee for archaeology. If you were working in a natural history in a university right. museum, there was already a committee for natural history so you could right. see that there was some need to go yeah. beyond the disciplines and move there to was. a level a different level of argumentation right uh, yeah and a different yeah a different level of discussion and, and, and talking about different kinds of issues than specific disciplinary ones but ones that are specific to museums in nested in parent organizations in universities. And so we were successful. We were, were able to make a convincing argument. And so UMAC was, was started. It was sort of a, well, I must say that the earliest conferences were not the most successfully organized. <laughs> um, the papers were not always um, terribly, terribly good, but uh, we prevailed. And we knew it would get better, and uh, and it did. And yeah, I would say that yeah. that the UMAC Journal and our conferences are now really, really well organized, yeah. well run, and very interesting. But Even if you're, we, yeah, sorry. yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. No, I well, just I wanted, wanted to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say that even if you're not a scientist, um, it's interesting to me if if you're not in the discipline. It's interesting that the papers have risen to a level so that they're interesting across disciplines. Yes, yes, that they they offer points of relevance yeah. to of different relevance. communities of different interests and so on with yes. the common denominator uh, of being a higher education. Being, yeah, exactly. Higher, higher education. So, but before we go, because I want to ask you about the changes, mm -hmm. but before. I would very much like to know what were your expectations? Okay, so you got involved immediately. You were in the mm -hmm. first board. You started, you know, very actively creating a newsletter and so on right. and helping around and so on. And so what were your expectations? You really thought, okay, we really can, can do something internationally. Yeah. So what I were thought, your, yeah. Yeah, I thought that we could raise the awareness of university museums internationally. I was particularly interested in getting more, uh, more of my colleagues from US museums involved internationally because again, I thought, you know, we're such a big country and we had yeah. strong um, museum associations in our yes. own country. Yeah. And so a lot of people didn't see the need yeah. to join yet like another. ICOM you know like yeah. ICOM the same problem the same yeah uh, the same yeah. the same thing and we had the American Association of Museums and we had the the old ACUMG now the AA um MG. A, uh, AA, yeah AAMG and so we had those and so a lot of American museum people didn't see the need for international to join yet another organization so uh, my expectations were to raise the level of international awareness on the part of my own colleagues within the US, um, as well as just um, raise the level of awareness among university administrators as to what, and I think that's still an issue for us yes. as university mm -hmm. museums, a really important issue and maybe more important now than ever before, to uh, raise the level of awareness among uh, a university administration as to what we could do. One of the most interesting things, Marta, that I learned from those early days was um, not only the similarities, but the differences. Because it seemed to me that in those early days, European museums particularly had all these collections. And one of their main concerns was getting control of their collections, getting inventories done, yes. getting, um, getting a handle on what they had. Conservation. Out, yeah, conservation, figuring out how to make their collections relevant mm -hmm. to, let's say, a contemporary scientific faculty yeah. or uh, yeah. a contemporary uh, natural history or, 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 or biological sciences faculty. And 
<laughs> because most European museums, I think, are started around taking care of collections at universities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons there are many more scientific museums and natural history museums in university European museums than in American museums, because they're so much older. And they have, I mean, if you, if you have all the, if you have Linnaeus on your faculty or Volta on your faculty, when he dies, you get his stuff. And what do you do? You make a museum to take care of it. It's but true. then what happens to all this stuff? And so the European museums, a lot of them were science, natural history, medicine, and they were really trying yeah, to get a handle on their stuff. Yeah, because the collections were generated through the practices of science. Exactly. And so, yeah, exactly. which is also happened in the U.S. But at the same time, there are, there is a very strong donor uh, dynamics yes. in the US that, that yes. doesn't exist in Europe. So you have a lot yes. of rich people and uh, that have wonderful, fabulous collections that make donations to universities, which is not the case at all in, in, uh, in, in Europe. Europe. So you also have that. And you, you, there are also fewer, fewer museums in city, local museums. So you have the University Art Museum also replacing, filling in a void that doesn't exist that much in Europe because there are more museums in cities and so on. Don't you think that there's a, a factor well, there also for the I, I do. And I think that in the US, there are many universities that aren't in cities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, uh, exactly. You know, particularly the big state universities are not yeah. uh, always in cities. We're unusual in Minneapolis because our, our main university is in the city. In the city. But very yeah. often, uh, particularly in the Midwest and the yeah. West, um, the, the universities are in much more rural areas. The cities of towns yeah, have grown yeah. up around them and they provide the only source of culture. The university exactly. provides the only source exactly. of culture for the exactly. whole region. region. So they, yes. they had this, they have this dual, um, yeah. this, this yeah. dual role. And yeah. also, um, in America, there are many more art museums and university campuses than science museums. We outnumber science yeah, museums and yeah, universities yeah, in yeah, the US, yeah. whereas it's not the case in Europe. No, and I no. have a lot of theories about this that really developed out of my involvement in UMAC, and I'm planning on writing maybe a book, at Absolutely. least a long paper, yeah. about how university museums growth sort of mirrors the growth of higher education exactly. in their context. And different traditions of higher education, different contexts, different politics of uh, higher education. That would be very, very interesting. And to different read. demographics of students. And as different well. demographics of students and dynamics, internal dynamics of movement, mobility, you know, exactly. different cultures of mobility of students. There's many, and, many factors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a and very good point. The fact that uh, in Europe, at least, um, most people grew up, if, if not in, a, in an urban area, that the rural areas are not so far from an urban area that had, in the terms of art, that had a major museum or a major church, which, mm -hmm. you know, which mm -hmm. had art. So even if you were in a rural area mm -hmm. in Europe, you were probably not more than an hour's train ride from a That's museum true. or something That's with true. art. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, where I grew up in my rural area, I was seven hours yeah. from a major art museum by car and there That's was no incredible. train. Of course. <laughs> no train. Of course. Of so course. I think there's that demographic too. The, the demographics. Geography. The geography makes a big difference too. So anyway, that's all whirling around in my brain and I hope it'll come out one of these days. But so my expectations really were to help establish a network um, so that we could learn from each other, help each other and uh, networks that we could call on when we needed consultation. And for us, particularly in America, to gain a broader perspective on what was going on uh, in universities around the world. That well, in that respect, it worked because uh, the Ameri uh, U.S. members of UMAC are, I think, the largest now yeah. nationality. Okay, of uh, members now is uh, the U.S. I mean, the, the, for a long time it was Europe, Europeans. You know, you had a lot of the U.K. and Germany, France, but uh, for two or three years. Um, since we had that meeting in Miami also helped, you know, when yeah, you go to a place, a when yeah. you go to a place and you get better norms, that's why the annual conferences are very important because they help stabilized, yeah. stabilize, uh, you know, networks yeah. and the relationships. Uh, yeah, and it's easier for people to, yeah. um, to uh, justify going to a meeting in their own country 
Um, and then if they realize it's valuable to them, then they may be willing to put up the money yeah, to go to yeah. a meeting. Of course. The next year course. when it's in or when it's in another country. Of so course. I think it I think it worked. I think it worked in that way. Yeah. But so to to sum up now a little bit, would you tell us a about the changes? What, what do you perceive as the progress we have made? Because I, I think I believe we made progress in some respects. Oh, yeah. Others are still, you know, challenges that we need to address certainly there's multiple you know would you like to highlight two or three yeah i mean i think that you've challenges. talked about some except of them, covid uh, not covid covid, not co oh, COVID not is COVID. Such, a, yeah. such a mess yeah. i mean i, I think our challenges some of our challenges are uh at university museums all over the world in encouraging um young professionals and i think that uh, we have a role to play through internships and i really would like us to see us promote more international internships um, at the at my at my museum we had a relationship again it was a stupid one of those not stupid but one of those sister city relationships with the with tour in france and so oh, for the wow. last mm -hmm. for the last four years we had um, interns who came to spend two to three months yeah. from the yeah. university of tour and they came to our museum and um, actually they lived with me and I provided room and board for them and they worked at wow. our museum and they uh, organized exhibitions. Yeah. What and an experience. They, what an experience must have been for them, right? It must have I been think incredible. so. I mean, um, it was it was incredible. It was great for our staff yeah. to meet them. And because most of our staff grew up in Minnesota and many have traveled but yeah, you know not yeah. all they're young yeah, they're yeah. young people and well, this, to meet interaction, people there, huh? this interaction yeah, yeah this interaction we had an intern who came from uh istanbul uh who stayed for a while uh it's harder for us to send people overseas because most of our people are are not bilingual yeah um yeah, yeah. in the united states we're very bad about that and so uh, since we don't speak another language most of us it's harder for us to send people but um, having the French interns, having the Turkish intern, yeah, uh, yeah. having a having a visiting uh, curator from uh, from uh, Finland for a semester, those kinds of exchanges, I think, are something that UMAC could really um, could yeah. really move into in yeah, in the future. Yeah. Longer term exchanges, because you know, if you're somewhere for a week for a conference, you gain something. Yeah. But if you're somewhere for three months, right you you gain quite a bit more when you're working as a staff member and all of our french interns have told us that they were given much more responsibility in uh our museum than they would have been given in a french museum for an oh, internship which i thought was interesting and i very think interesting that's, mm -hmm. that's true we do tend to push responsibility we down do. A little we, bit do. Further. we do we do we um, do mm -hmm. so, that's a very good point that's a very good point yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so what I else like um, I think that um, our conferences are getting better. I think that um, with, um, and I know you don't want to talk about COVID, but I do think that there's, a, <laughs> okay. there's, there's, there's pressure, there's pressure on higher education, even without COVID, Mark. I know, I know. There's a lot of pressure on higher education. The, don't uh, get me wrong. I think that we should talk about COVID, but it's a whole different conversation. It's a whole different conversation, yeah. Exactly, exactly. But I do think there's, um, a lot of pressure on university museums and on universities these days. Yes. And I uh, was uh, formerly a co-chair of the Committee uh, for Protection of uh, University Collections here in the United States because, oh, 10 years ago or so, we had a spate of um, university boards threatening to sell their universities' collections to make up for uh, gaps in finances, mismanagement of finances perhaps at their universities. And so I worry about governments in, the, in Europe, as you know, most, um, most European museums at least are sponsored by governments. Yeah, yeah. And as a state university, we are as well. And it was interesting for me to look back at the talk I gave 20 years ago when I said that only 33% of our university's budget was um, was sponsored by uh, by the state of yeah, Minnesota. Yeah. Now it's 15%, Marta. Wow. In 20 years, it's gone down. The budget has gone up. The state support state has gone support down. State support has gone down. 
Yeah, to 15%. So, mm -hmm. or 15 to 18%, I, <laughs> I think. So yeah, I, I think, think that's a national, that's a trend everywhere. Also South America, yeah. uh, Europe, certainly there's been a kind of, um, you know, the, the governments, the, the public state sort of has been uh, receding on the, the amount of commitment. It's political too, you know, it's it's, political, it depends yeah. on, it's certainly it's, political. Yeah, it's yeah. political, absolutely. And so I think that we have to be more vigilant um and and more protective of our assets perhaps we have to be a little bit more careful about what we bring into our collections yeah, yeah, because yeah. as you know um taking care of collections is not free no it absolutely. um it requires no. special environments it requires specially trained people yeah. and <coughs> excuse me and and not only taking care of them but putting our collections to work yeah. and being yeah. really creative about how we make our collections work for us so that the university can't see us anymore as icing on the cake, right. but will see us as uh, a major part of Structural. the structure, yeah. that we are part of the academic inter enterprise. I worry a little bit about this trend toward online because yeah, we're yeah. based on objects. Yeah, that's and right. our, a, a lot of our value, I think, is based on, on object-based learning. Yeah. And so the more things go online, the easier it's going to become for yeah. people who don't understand the value of our collections to disregard them. Mm -hmm. So I think we do have to be vigilant about that. Of course, you know, we're all pivoting to go to put programs online. But, um, but at the same time, I think yeah. we shouldn't forget and lose sight of our collections, no. which is no which is our infrastructure, it's our core. Yes. And so we may It's have what to makes us different, right? Exactly. Because you can find all sorts of contents online. You oh, just absolutely. go on YouTube, whatever, you find all sorts of contents. And it's important because it provides access to lots of people, demographics, people who are exactly. remote, you know, yeah. uh, that's very good. But nothing replaces, right? Nothing replaces a first-hand encounter with, with, with an object, a with the materiality, object. yeah, yeah. And, and you can't, I mean, we had a ceramics professor in our art department who uh, helped us build a really excellent ceramics collection because he believed that if you're going to learn to make ceramics, you have to handle them. You right. have to handle ceramics of the past. And so we have an art study room where um, we would always bring up anything from the collection that he wanted for his class and they could touch it. I mean, of course, under supervision, but uh, you don't get that on the internet. You can't no. feel the body no. of a, a ceramic pot from looking at a picture of it, even if it's 3D and manipulable, you don't, yeah, you don't have no, the same experience. No, and it's not the same, the same experience. Uh, I mean, I talk about the art world because that's the world I know. It's the same but, with a fossil, okay? Yeah. It's exactly the same with a fossil, with a herbarium specimen. It's exactly the same. You need, uh, with a manuscript, yeah, and one of the things, well, one of the things that has happened in recent years, okay, that's a whole different discussion. But archives have moved a lot towards digitization, you know, providing access online, and sometimes in small archives, not the big national archives, it's yeah. in small archives, so university archives. Sometimes, the digitization has put in question the existence of the materiality of the of the manuscript. I know okay? that. So, I, I, I we have to be that. very, very careful about what we defend. Are we in the material world of things and providing encounters? Uh, with, with, with reality, with, real, with the real yeah, world. Yeah, with the real yeah, world. Not just world. the digital world. And, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, so, so yeah, um, yeah. and I think it's so important for students to understand that as yeah. well as to reinforce, help us reinforce that point with the university administration. That's true. So we need to give those real experiences to students so they will become spokespeople for us mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. will be the first to, to protest, shall right. I say, right. if right. the university threatens, if, if our parent organization, because of need of funds to support- or space, or space. Or space or, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that the, our students will speak up for our collections. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think that is, is a it's task for It's still a problem. It's still, it's still, still, still a problem. problem. Yeah. And yeah. perhaps it's going to be even more of a problem um, in no, Okay, the so the, we, comes COVID, enters COVID, right? There yeah, is a layer, a layer of uh, difficulty 
uh, economic, financial, and so on brought by COVID in ways and scale that we don't even imagine. We cannot, you know, really exactly. grasp. And universities so, are struggling, struggling because of are, COVID. They are, they are, and they they've got big infrastructures, at least in the US, maybe not so much in Europe, but in the US, they have lots of buildings and yes, classrooms. Yes. <laughs> to take care of or to maintain and if there are no students sitting in them um and if, you know then then they then they've got a problem they've got a problem <laughs> so <clears throat> as they look for solutions to their problem i don't want our museums to become the solutions to the university's financial problems Martha. of course i understand and of i worry course. about that i worry yeah. about that so um, I think there's definitely a role for, for UMAC to be create, help us be creative, yeah, yeah. help us articulate our value, and not just articulate it, but live it. Excellent. Excellent point to closure. You know, it's fantastic. Thank you, Mark. It's fantastic. Can, but wait, not totally closure, because I want oh, okay. to ask you something before we go. Yes, all right. Would you tell me, this is totally unprepared. Okay. But I'm sure you have an answer. You cannot answer with your museum. So okay. which is your favorite university? Recommend, okay, not the favorite, but recommend our viewers, especially the younger generation, uh, oh. young professionals of university museums, students of museum studies who want to, you know, to visit a university museum. Which is one that they should visit? The, Anywhere, uh, Thailand, museum, Singapore, uh, Thailand, museum, Singapore. Yeah. Okay, the Museum of Traditional Medicine and Shanghai at the uh, University of Traditional Medicine. Wow. We visited that. I've been there we, too. Yeah. Yeah, you've been there too. Do you remember that museum? Amazing. Amazing. That was so fascinating. I still tell people about the early models they used for acupuncture exams. Yeah, yeah. yes. And yes, yes. Um, I see all the specimens and uh, I, I, I loved that museum. It's completely out of my realm. Yeah, our, uh, you know, our reference, normal references that we have. That's perfect answer. <laughs> and I'm sure the Chinese who will be seeing this will love it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And entirely deserved because it's a fantastic museum and uh, deserves to be much better known. So, Lindell, now yes. I'm mindful of your time. Oh, and, uh, thank yeah. you. And it I'm, was a I'm pleasure. Happy to do this. Yeah, me too. I love it. Marta, I just have to tell you, I so remember you in the beginning days of UMAC. Okay, let's not when, go there. Let's when not you were go. a young graduate student, and I am so glad that you are now the president of UMAC and taking us into the future. So thank you for your leadership. Okay, thank you. You're so sweet. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for watching on uh, YouTube. And uh, thank you also to the University of Lisbon for using the Zoom platform. And we will be having more episodes of oh. uh, UMAC Origins. So stay tuned. I'll be glad. I'll be Thank glad you. to hear them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.